In this video, I'm going to talk about the relationship between the standard reduction potential, the standard change in Gibbs free energy, and the equilibrium constant. So we've already seen um, in previous chapters that the equilibrium constant is um, a quantity that tells us the direction that a reaction is likely to proceed. So the equilibrium constant gives us the ratio of products to reactants at equilibrium when the reaction has when the, the concentrations of reactant and product have stopped changing and so the equilibrium constant tells us are there going to be more products is the concentration of products greater at equilibrium or is the concentration of reactants greater at equilibrium so if k is greater than one and the products the concentration of products are greater than reactants then we can say that if we start with those reactants, the reaction will move forward spontaneously. And conversely, if um, the equilibrium constant K is less than one, then that means that there are more reactants at equilibrium, which means that if we start with reactants, pure reactants, then the reaction might move forward a bit to product, um, but it won't go 100%. Uh, so K tells us whether a reaction is likely to move more likely to move forwards if we start with 100% reactant or more likely to move backwards if we start if we look at it, the reverse reaction and we start with 100% of the product so um, delta G the, the, the standard change in Gibbs free energy tells us the same thing which is that if delta G is negative that means the reaction is spontaneous in the forward direction, which means it's likely to proceed in the forward direction without um, any outside intervention or any outside energy input. Um, and conversely, if delta G is positive, then a reaction is not spontaneous in the forward direction, or it is spontaneous in the reverse direction. So K and G both tell us, does a reaction go forward or backwards at standard conditions? So um, E naught cell, the reduction potential, tells us the same thing, such that if we have a positive uh, reduction potential, then that means that the reaction is likely to move forward as written. And if we have a negative reduction potential, the reaction is, is spontaneous in the reverse direction. So E and G and K are really all telling us the same thing. Does a reaction go forwards or does a reaction go backwards? Is it more likely uh, to have more products at equilibrium or does it have more reactants at equilibrium? So um, there's a, a, a ma there's a, this qualitative relationship between these forwards and backwards and there's also of course a quantitative relationship which tells us how they're related mathematically. So we've seen in a previous chapter that delta G delta G naught equals negative RT ln K so that the Gibbs the change in Gibbs free energy is related to the equilibrium constant um, and now we show that there's a further relationship which that the G is related to K and both of those are also related to the uh, reduction potential the cell reduction potential so this um, relationship here um, where all of these delta G and K and E are all kind of telling us the same information, we can, uh, depending on what we're given in the problem, we can kind of arrive at any of these three variables, since they're all essentially the same information in, uh, with a, with a different, in a different disguise. So um, this is the first time that we're seeing this, react, uh, this equation here. So um, delta G naught, the Gibbs free energy, is equal to negative N times F times the reduction potential. So N is the number of electrons in the reaction. So when we look at our half reactions, this is the number of electrons in the balanced half reactions, um, which is also uh, st it's stoichiometrically um, when, we're when we're thinking about the relationship of the electrons to the uh, compounds in the reaction, but it's also, we can think of those, remember the stoichiometric coefficients, we can also think of those as moles. So this is also equal to the number of moles of electrons. So um, we'll see this again as we move forward with reactions. 
uh, with excuse me with these equations um, and f is called Faraday's constant and Faraday's constant is tells us the amount of charge per a mole of electrons so in this case it's 96,485 coulombs per mole of electrons and so this allows us to um, <clears throat> Uh, convert our, our stoichiometric coefficient from a balanced chemical reaction, again a balanced half reaction, um, to convert that to a cell potential. So that if I ha know how many moles of electrons I'm dealing with, I can talk about the charge that's associated with mole of electrons and um, multiply that by the reduction potential, which will be a voltage, which will also tell us you know, how much charge we're talking about. So um, there's a relationship between the reaction quotient Q and K and delta G. So we, um, we have obviously seen the relationship between K and G and E, um, but whenever we're talking about delta G naught or E naught, we're talking about uh, quantities that are measured under standard conditions. So standard conditions being temperature generally 25 degrees C and the concentration being one molar and pressure being one atmosphere and so on. Um, so what do we do, what, what is the cell potential when the ion concentrations are not one? So if we're not at equilibrium, if K doesn't apply, then remember what we're actually calculating when we put those numbers into an equilibrium expression, we're actually calculating Q, which is the reaction quotient. So if we're not at equilibrium, then it, we're not really looking at K, we're looking at Q. And if we're not at standard conditions, we're not really looking at delta G naught, we're looking at delta G without the standard symbol. And we're not looking at E naught, we're looking at just E without the standard symbol. E, maybe the temperature is different, or maybe the concentration is not one molar. So because the standard change in free energy determines the cell potential, the voltage for the cell will be different when the ion concentrations are not one molar. So, uh, for example, here are, is the same cell. So the same cell that has different concentrations. The con in this cell, the, both of the concentrations of the zinc 2 plus on this side and the copper 2 plus on this side are both one molar. So these are standard conditions. It's, we'll consider, assume that it's 25 degrees C. Um, one molar of, for each solution. A solid uh, has a constant concentration, so we don't have to worry about the concentration of the solid. It's not involved um, in the standard conditions. So when we're looking at this equation, everything here is under standard conditions. So the voltage that we measure for this cell should be the, vol the exact voltage that we would look up in a table that we could use reduction potentials to calculate this same exact voltage. But if the concentrations are not the same, are not one molar, so zinc 2 plus here much less than one molar and copper 2 plus is two molar, so if the concentrations in these cells, even though everything else is exactly the same, it's the same oxidation reaction, the same reduction reaction, the same solid zinc and solid copper, the same salt bridge, all of the components are exactly the same, but the concentration is different, then the voltage that we measure across the cell is going to be different. Um, and that's because the, what, what we're changing, of course, is the value of Q, the reaction quotient. Because if we change the concentration of zinc or copper reactants or products, um, we're changing the numbers that go into that equilibrium expression. And those numbers are going to affect the value that we get for Q and therefore the value that we get for delta G if we're under non-standard conditions and therefore the value that we get for E since they're all related. So the, well, the equation that we use to calculate um, the cell potential when we're not under standard conditions is called the Nernst equation. So um, we can derive the Nernst equation from what we already know, which is that we saw this in the thermodynamics chapter. Um, the, cell, the, Gibbs free, the change in Gibbs free energy under non-standard conditions is equal to the Gibbs is equal to the change in Gibbs free energy under standard conditions. So we can think about delta G equals delta G naught, right? Plus some some change. 
So these two things are nearly equal. Delta G under standard conditions and delta G under non-standard conditions are almost the same. And the way in which they are different depends upon the temperature and it depends upon the concentrations. So R is just a constant, right? So if the temperature is non-standard and the concentrations are non-standard, then delta G under non-standard conditions will be a bit different than delta G under standard conditions. So um, if we, we've seen already that uh, delta G naught equals N uh, negative N the uh, moles of electrons times Faraday's constant times the standard reduction potential. So delta G naught equals negative N F E naught. So therefore, delta G under non-standard conditions equals negative N F E under non-standard conditions. So we can replace these two variables with um, their electrochemical equivalent. And we'll leave the plus R T L and Q in here. And so um, we basically just take the N and the E, or excuse me, the N and the F, uh, the moles of electrons in Faraday's constant, and move them over here. So divide each side by negative n f right which would leave one over here and cancel these out so e cell would be by itself so we've moved the nf over here and what we show is that um, the cell potential under non-standard conditions is equal to the cell potential under standard conditions right they're almost the same thing just like these two are almost the same thing and the way in which they're different is that I have to either add or subtract some uh, quantity that's a factor of the temperature. R is a constant, F is a constant, N, the moles of electrons, so the temperature can be different, the moles of electrons can be different, um, and the um, reaction quotient, which is derived from the concentrations of reactant and product. So the things that make uh, E cell not standard could be the temperature, or the moles of electrons, or the concentrations. So if we're not talking about the temperature being different, then we can um, consider the temperature is 25 degrees C. So we're saying that we're still running the cell under standard temperature. So in that case, the only thing that's different is going to be the concentrations. So if uh, the temperature is 25 degrees C, or 298 Kelvin, then we can combine R and T and F because they would all be constant, right, if we consider that T is constant. And so if all of those values combined uh, would give us this number, 0 0.0592 volts divided by the number of electrons, or the moles of electrons, so N wasn't a constant, that's a variable still. And we have changed the natural log of Q to the log of Q. And so if we're still under standard temperature, if we're still at 25 degrees C, then this is a really easy version of this equation because I've combined R and T and F into a number instead of having to put those values in every time because if those values are constant and they're not going to change, then why not just combine them all into one number, which is what this equation does. However, if we're not at standard temperature, then we can still use this version of the equation and put in a different temperature up here. So um, that shows us that if the cell potential is different given different concentrations of a reaction, so if I'm at one molar for reactants and products, then the cell potential is equal to the standard cell potential that I would look up in a table. But if I have less than one molar reactant and more than one molar product, the E cell will be different than if I have more than one molar product and less than one molar reactant. So what I mean by that is that depending on the way in which the reactants and products are different than one molar, do I have more reactant and less product? Or do I have less reactant and more product? Um, that changes E cell in the opposite direction. So what that means is that I can get a spontaneous reaction. I can make a voltaic cell where I have two different half reactions where they're not really different half reactions, where the half reaction in each cell is actually the same half reaction, and the only thing that's different about them is that they have different concentrations, and we can still get a flow of electrons in that case. 
So we call these concentration cells. So what we've been showing so far is where we can calculate a reduction potential based on the relative differences between the oxidation half reaction and the reduction half reaction. And if we change the oxidation half reaction to a different substance, we move it higher or lower on that table, it's going to change the cell potential. And, and the same is true um, for the reduction half reaction. So what we're saying here is that if the reduction and the oxidation reaction are actually the same exact reaction, we can still make the electrons move, we can still get a spontaneous reaction as long as the concentration in each cell is different. So this difference in energy that causes the electrons to flow even though the half reactions are the same is due to the entropic difference in the solutions. So the more concentrated solution has lower entropy than the less concentrated solution. And so the tendency is to make the lower entropy system gain entropy until the entropy is equivalent. So what that means is that electrons will flow from the electrode in the less concentrated solution to the electrode in the more concentrated solution. Um, oxidation of the electron in the less concentrated solution will increase the ion concentration. So the less concentration solution, concentrated solution will increase in concentration and reduction of the solution ions at the electrode in the more concentrated solution reduces the ion concentration. So basically what they're saying is that if, if we have a difference in concentration and the half reaction is the same, that electrons flow from the, electron, from the electrode in the less concentrated solution to the electrode in the more concentrated solution. And the reason that that, that sounds kind of counterintuitive, that electrodes are going from the less concentrated to the more concentrated. But the reason that happens is because when the electrons arrive at the more concentrated solution, what they do is they react with an ion that's in solution, and they remove that ion from solution by making it turn solid, by reducing that ion. So as the electrons arrive in the more concentrated solution, they're actually reducing the concentration of the solution by reacting with the ions that are in the solution. And vice versa, as the electrons leave the compartment that's being oxidized, that's be that which has the lower concentration, then as the electrons leave, a piece of the solid electrode becomes an ion, and that ion then increases the concentration in that compartment. So the compartment with the lower concentration eventually gets a higher concentration as it becomes oxidized, and the um, concentration in the other compartment eventually goes lower and lower and lower as it gets reduced until eventually they're at the same level, right? The one that is oxidized goes up, the one that's reduced goes down, and eventually they meet in the middle. And at that point, they are at equilibrium again, and the concentration in each cell will be equal. And when the concentration in both cells is equal, then there's no longer a move from one cell to the other. So here's an example of a concentration cell. You can see that there's, on each side I have copper solid and copper solid, and copper 2 plus and copper 2 plus. So each half reaction is exactly the same. Um, but I can still say that one side is the anode or one side is the cathode, as long as the concentration in each, uh, the concentration in one side is different than the other. So if the, in here we can see the concentration is not different, they're both one molar. So here, there's, there's one molar copper on this side, one molar copper on this side. Everything is exactly the same. If everything is exactly the same, there's no uh, drive for the electrons to move one direction or the other, so they don't move one direction or the other, and the, uh, the cell potential, the standard cell potential for a concentration cell is zero, which makes sense because remember that under standard conditions, this has to be one molar, and this has to be one molar. And if those two are the same, this, the um, cell potential is zero. But if these are not one molar, then the tendency is for electrons to move one direction or the other to make them equal. So here's another example. In this one, there, each electrode is still made of solid copper, but in this, uh, in this beaker I have 0 0.01 molar copper and in this beaker I have two molar copper so this is less than one molar and on this side it's more than one molar so since these are not equal 
there's going to be some movement from one side or the other in order to make them become equal. And so the way that that works is that electrons go from the less concentrated side. So the electrons are going to go this way. They're going to leave the uh, copper, uh, the copper solid, and they're going to travel this way and move through the voltmeter and go into this compartment. And when the electrons arrive in this compartment, they're going to reduce the copper 2 plus on this side. So remember that as copper solid is oxidized, it becomes copper 2 plus and it loses two electrons. So the copper solid will lose two electrons this way, and it will also, the copper solid will become copper 2 plus, right? So as the copper solid becomes copper 2 plus, this number, 0 0.01, is going to get bigger. So then the electrons go this way, and the electrons enter this compartment, and they reduce copper 2 plus on this side. So when the electrons reduce copper 2 plus, then it turns into solid copper. Copper 2 plus plus those electrons become solid copper. So copper 2 plus is being removed from this solution. The electrons arrive, and they remove copper 2 plus by reacting with it. So this concentration is going to decrease. So this one gets bigger as it's oxidized, and this one gets smaller as it's reduced. And when they meet in the middle, the concentration cell will again be equal, even if it's not equal to 1. If, both, if the concentration in both cells is equal, the standard, or excuse me, the cell potential will be equal to 0. So um, what we've looked at so far are voltaic cells. And voltaic cells take advantage of a difference in uh, cell potential on each side, reduction potential from the oxidation half and the reduction half reaction. And it can take advantage of this difference in cell potential to make electrons move from one side of the, of the cell to the other side. And as the electrons are moving from one side to the other side, we can make them pass through some circuit and make them do work. So we can light up a light bulb, or we can measure their cell potential, or we can, uh, depending on the voltage, make many other things happen in some kind of electric circuit board. So um, uh, when we're looking at a voltaic cell, we're taking advantage of a difference in cell potential in each cell, which causes the electrons to move in one direction. And as they move, we can make them do work. So this is the ball rolling down the hill. Voltaic cells take advantage of spontaneous reactions to make the ball roll down the hill. And as the ball rolled out, rolls down the hill, we can make it do something. We can capture its energy, and we can make it turn the, uh, the mill or something, right? In a waterfall, we capture the, the, the falling water, and it makes the wheel spin. And the, the spinning wheel can be used to do work. That's exactly what's happening here with the spontaneous reaction. An electrolytic cell is one in which we're trying to drive the reaction backwards. So we're trying to push the ball up the hill in this case. So we're not getting any useful work out of it. We're not getting any energy out by pushing the ball downhill. In fact, the ball is already at the bottom, and we want to push it back uphill. We want to push the ball back to the top of the hill. So if we can run an electro or a voltaic cell backwards, um, and if we, if, it, if we put in the amount of energy that was given off when the reaction is spontaneous in the forward direction, then we can run the reaction in the reverse direction. So when the ball rolls down the hill in the forward direction, when this reaction is spontaneous, it produces a cell potential of 1.1 volts. So if the reaction is already at equilibrium, and I put a battery in now, and I supply 1.1 volts of electricity to this system, then I can make the, those electrons that, that, have a, that want to go downhill, the electrons are going downhill this way, then I can make those electrons go uphill. I can push them back to the compartment which they're, not, that, which they're less likely to go to, which is a non-spontaneous reaction. So again, this goes back to what we talked about in the thermodynamics chapter. When a reaction is spontaneous, that means that the ball can roll down the hill all by itself. And then we, we have to nudge the ball. That's called activation energy. So we have to give the ball a little tiny push. But after we give it a little tiny push, 
it rolls down the hill all by itself without any extra added energy. It, it picks up momentum because of some force, the gravitational force in that case. So when uh, we're talking about a spontaneous reaction, we're talking about one in which the reactants want to become products or in which there's a driving force. The chemical potential between the reactants and products is different so that the, the energy m moves spontaneously from reactants to products and uh, the ball rolls down the hill. But remember when we were in that chapter, we said that non-spontaneous non reactions don't happen by themselves, but that doesn't mean that they're impossible, that they cannot occur. Non-spontaneous reactions can occur when a spontaneous reaction means the ball rolls down the hill by itself, and a non-spontaneous reaction means we push the ball back up the hill. We can absolutely put energy into systems to make non-spontaneous reactions occur. So an electrolytic cell is just a non-spontaneous reaction where we've put in the amount of energy that we would otherwise get out and we run the reaction backwards. Electrolysis is the process of using electrical energy to break a compound apart. So this is uh, an example of um, a redox reaction. In the anode we have um, liquid water can make oxygen gas plus four hydrogen ions, H plus, plus four electrons. So in the uh, anode, we show that oxygen goes from a negative two oxidation state in water to a zero oxidation state. So it's oxidized in this case from H2O to O2. And in this side, if we have H2O and it gains two electrons, then the H2O uh, can go from H plus, where H is in a plus one oxidation state in water, to H zero. So that H goes from plus one to zero, it's reduced. So when H2O is converted to oxygen, it's oxidized, its oxidation state increases. And when H2O is converted to hydrogen, its ox hydrogen's oxidation state decreases, so it's reduced. So this reaction would move uh, in the opposite direction if it were spontaneous. So the spontaneous direction of this reaction is that oxygen gas and hydrogen gas will combine spontaneously to make water. But if I put energy into the system, if I have a battery and I put in the amount of the same energy as the cell potential run in the spontaneous direction, then I can, instead of making O2 plus H2 make water, then I can use water to make O2 and H2. I can run the reaction in reverse. So um, this is called electrolysis, and uh, electrolytic cells can be used to separate elements from their compounds. So this is one way that we can make sodium metal, for example. Um, we have a huge source of sodium, Sodium metal is pretty reactive. Sodium metal reacts with water. So if you put sodium in water, it reacts violently. Sometimes it, it uh, causes a fire. And the reason is because Na solid, the sodium has a zero oxidation state. It's a pure element. But Na in its most stable state is Na plus. So Na readily gives up an electron to water and oxidizes, uh, or excuse me, it reduces the uh, the water and it makes H2 in this same sense. So um, there's there's not much sodium metal in the environment because it's very reactive. Uh, there's a lot of Na plus though because there's lots of salt everywhere. The the ocean is made of salt water, so we have Na plus and Cl minus, and there's a huge supply of, of sodium there. It's just not sodium metal. It's not Na zero. It's Na plus. So one way that we can produce sodium metal from Na plus from salt water is using electrolysis. So if we put salt water into an electrolytic cell and we supply enough energy to the salt water, then I can separate the Na from the Cl minus. And the Cl minus would give its electron back to the sodium. So then I would have Na zero and Cl zero, and I can create sodium metal and chlorine gas that way. 
So it, it's breaking it's breaking a compound apart, Na plus Cl minus, into pure Na and pure Cl, or H2O into pure H and pure O. So in electrolysis, we use electrical energy to overcome the energy barrier of a non-spontaneous reaction. So the reaction that takes place is the opposite of the spontaneous process. So again, spontaneous, hydrogen gas and oxygen gas makes water. That's the spontaneous process. But I can run that in reverse and use water to make hydrogen gas and oxygen gas if I supply enough energy. We call that process electrolysis. So another uh, application of electrolytic cells is um, what we call electroplating. So in electroplating, we can use a metal, uh, a, we can put some metal into a solution and the, we can use the ion that's in solution as we reduce it to kind of stick to whatever metal we put in there. So for example, sometimes people have gold rings and they don't like the yellow color of gold so they would rather it be kind of a, a white color so they can electroplate that gold ring with silver and the way that you would do that is you put the gold in and hook it up as an electrode so the metal itself the, the metal the gold metal would be in contact with the metal of this electrode of the anode and as the electrons in this electrolytic reaction were being pushed this way towards the anode, the silver plus ions that are in solution are being reduced. An electron comes off of here, the silver plus gets the electron and sticks to the gold metal. So eventually the gold metal is completely coated in silver atoms and the gold has been electroplated in silver. So it's important to consider the stoichiometry when we're looking at any redox reaction. Um, and uh, a lot of times when we're thinking about electrolysis and electroplating, we're doing um, calculations that involve uh, how, how much, uh, calculating how much mass we might get from running an electrolytic reaction for a certain amount of time. Um, and so in that case, we have to know how many electrons, how many moles of electrons are being transferred. So in an electrolytic cell, the amount of product made is related to the number of electrons transferred. So the electrons are considered a reactant in these reactions. So just like whenever we're doing stoichiometry calculations, and it's really important to consider the coefficients in front of each reactant and, and each product, we can't forget the electrons as a reactant when we're looking at redox reactions. So it's really important to consider the half reactions where we actually can see those electrons. Because remember, when we combine half reactions together, the electrons aren't really visible when we look at a redox reaction, a full molecular redox reaction. So it's, it's um, more insightful to look at half reactions where we can actually see the number, the stoichiometric coefficient in front of the, the number, uh, the moles of electrons. So the number of moles of electrons that flow through the electrolytic cell depends on the current and length of time. So um, we'll consider Faraday's constant that the charge of one mole of electrons is 96,485 coulombs and that one amp, remember that's the current, how many electrons are moving in any amount of time is equal to one coulomb of charge per second. So amp is how many electrons are moving.